All right. So what is an experiment? Well, an experiment requires you to manipulate one variable and measure the impact of that manipulation on another. And I'll explain what I mean as I go. Now, the benefit of an experiment over correlational methods and over observational methods is you can, with an experiment, determine cause and effect. Experiments allow you, I'll repeat, to determine cause and effect, and it also allows you to explain behavior. Now, so your four ways to understand behavior are describe, predict, determine cause and effect, and explain. With observational strategies, all we can do is describe what we see. Now, what's the difference between describing and explaining behavior? With an experiment, we can explain behavior. We can explain why the behavior occurs, not just what occurred, but why it occurs or how this factor functions. So an experiment is the most powerful of the research strategies. So I said to you that with an experiment, you have to be able to manipulate a variable. Now, the variable that we manipulate is called the independent variable. And in order to be a variable, it has to have the potential to have two or more levels or conditions. And the basic experiment has, at a minimum, an experimental group or condition and a control group or condition. So two groups, right? The experimental group is going to receive the manipulation or the treatment. The control group is not. The control group does not receive the manipulation or treatment. It serves as a comparison. Because if we had a treatment, we could say, in the presence of the treatment, we found X. In the absence of the treatment, we found Y. Well, the dependent variable is the, the outcome. The dependent variable is the measured variable. After we manipulated the independent variable, what happened? We measure the dependent variable. And if there are significant differences between the experimental group and the control group, we can say whatever that factor was caused the changes to our dependent variable. Now, in order to do that, we have the independent variable and the dependent variable, but we also have to get rid of extraneous variables or confounding variables. One of the problems with correlation, I said was the third variable problem. With a correlation, there's an, an unlimited or infinite number of outside factors that could have caused this outcome. Well, with an experiment, we do our best to get rid of or eliminate confounds. The confounds are these outside factors. So if we can eliminate all of these outside factors and say only the independent variable cause changes to the dependent variable, we know it's a true cause. So uh, I do want to break down cause and effect relationships a little bit further as well. There were researchers by the name of Cook and Campbell who said in order for something to be a cause, it has to have three properties. The first property is temporal precedence. The cause must always precede the effect. One of the problems with the correlation was we didn't know if factor A led to B or whether B led to A. With a causal relationship, factor A always leads to B, not the other way around. So that is the first element according to Cook and Campbell, temporal precedence. The second wow. element is covariation of the cause. That is in the presence of the cause, you get the effect. In the absence of the cause, you don't. When we look at our experimental group and our control group, we're trying to see covariation of the cause in the presence versus in the absence. And the third and final element 
was that we need to eliminate alternative explanations. So if we can get rid of confounds, we get rid of alternative explanations. So how do we get rid of confounds though? Uh, well, uh, when we talk about getting rid of confounds, there are two ways we do it. Random assignment and uh, matching. So when we do random assignment, what we are doing is using an unbiased way to assign a person to the control group versus um, the experimental group. And if you have a large enough sample, we assume that the groups are roughly equivalent. Now I'll say that again. If you have a large enough sample, the control group and the experimental group will have roughly similar properties on everything but the independent variable. So there's going to be a, you know, similar age profile, similar gender profile, anything that could influence this because we randomly assigned uh, a large enough sample, we should be fine. Now, if you pay attention to my words, I said we assume that they're equivalent, but there is another way we can do this. Uh, and it's a form of systematic control. When you when you think about systematic control, you're treating all groups the same on everything other than the independent variable. Well, we have a paradigm called a matching procedure. And a matching procedure is where we take a, a measurement before we introduce the independent variable to make sure that the groups are roughly equivalent. So we wouldn't typically use the dependent variable itself, but we would use something that's strongly related to the dependent variable. So we would give some kind of assessment. Let's say we, I don't know, we were doing mathematical abilities and we thought IQ could be a confound. We might do some kind of quick IQ test and make sure that the control group and the experimental group are roughly equivalent on IQ so that the that doesn't creep in. Now you can still apply both procedures, randomization and systematic control. And if you do that, the, the things you cannot get rid of, you neutralize. Uh, questions on that? I thought I heard someone say something, but I was in the middle of a flow. Anyone have a question on that? Okay. Well, then let's continue. There are different types of experiments similar to the naturalistic observation and the systematic observation where one happened in the real world and one happened in a lab. We do have the concept of a lab experiment and a field experiment. When you use a lab experiment, that controls for all the outside factors. If it happens in a lab, you have greater control over confounds, greater control over what happens. So that's a good thing in one right. But the same question we ask in our uh, observational strategies is at play. Were the conditions so artificial in the lab that they don't generalize to the real world? So one of the questions about lab experiments is artificiality and uh, by extension, generalizability. So we do have a way of addressing this as well. There are field experiments. Now field experiments, they're still experiments. You're still manipulating the independent variable, but you're collecting data, not in the lab, but in the real world. And because you're collecting the data in the real world or natural settings, we assume people are behaving normally or naturally. So the generalizability from your study to the real world is increased because it happened in the real world. The problem is similar to other naturalistic observations is when you're collecting data in the real world, you don't have as much control over 
the confounds. So it's a trade-off. Lab experiments, you have more control over confounds, but weaker generalizability. Field experiments, you have less control over confounds, but greater generalizability. Now, the last thing I'll say for today, and then we'll put a pin in it, is there is something called a quasi-experimental design. Now, a quasi-experimental design is not quite an experimental design. What do I mean by that? When we do a quasi-experimental design, we are not randomly assigning you to a group. We are taking pre-existing conditions and then comparing group differences that way. So something like gender. Can I manipulate gender? The answer is no, right? You bring your gender identification into the study with you. Can I study gender differences? The answer is yes. But it's not a true experimental design because I couldn't manipulate that factor. Age, same thing with age. Can I manipulate age? No. Can I study age-related differences on a given phenomenon? The answer is yes. So quasi-experimental designs are used when you could not manipulate the variable of interest, where you can't have a true independent variable. Doesn't mean you can't compare differences, but you have to be very careful against making causal inferences with a quasi-experimental design. And with that, I will stop. So let me stop the recording. I will take attendance and we'll go from there.